All right. Thanks everyone for being here today. Um, I, I'm glad that you're able to join us. We have Rachel Van Skoik, correct? Yes, <laughs> From the, the California Academy of Sciences. And um, she has graciously joined us today to talk to you about the Science Action Club and some citizen science uh, curriculum that they have to offer that I'm sure all of you will love. So um, without further, further ado, Rachel, thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Excited to be here. Uh, I am reporting out from San Francisco. Dallas was sharing that it's nice fall time transitioning from the summer there. We have dense fog here in my neighborhood. So you'll see I'm in a turtleneck. I'm kind of cold. I'm also still sipping my coffee from this morning. So <laughs> a little bit different uh, ecosystems that we're in, but I'm excited to be here digitally with all y'all. Um, I have a little icebreaker to get our brains in the Science Action Club space here. Um, hopefully y'all can see those slides. And I would love to uh, have lots of participation today. I'll pull up our chat box so I can see all y'all's comments in there. Um, definitely wanna get some interaction and some digital conversation today. So uh, for our icebreaker, this is called Spot the Differences. This is from one of our units called Bird Scouts. Um, and typically we do this activity in person with some cards that we hand out for the youth and give them a timer. Say you got five minutes and you need to list out all the differences that you see in these two images. So we're gonna do that in just about, let's say a minute this morning. Um, so start looking for differences between these two birds that we have listed and you can go ahead and chat those in as soon as you start seeing them. Don't need to wait uh, for any of them. Recording in progress. And as, um, as you look at these images, you'll see a lot more differences. I've run this a few times with folks and there are a few things that I did not notice in these two images that people have pointed out to me, which is really cool. Uh, oh, we got a lot of great ones. Uh, spots on the underside, the leaves are different. Yeah, exactly. Not just the birds, but the ecosystem, the plants that they're on, head coloring, awesome. Uh, wing coloring, head and cape color, belly color, beak size. These are all fantastic. Um, these, uh, this is an example of an activity that is a precursor to going out and doing uh, bird watching with youth. So you're really kind of getting them to focus their attention, get those observation skills going. Um, okay, I'll wait to see if we have any more responses, any final um, details that folks are noticing and spot the differences. Uh, one thing that I do notice is on the left, there is a acorn, some kind of food source for that bird. And on the right, uh, there is no food source. So that one is probably a hungry woodpecker because it needs to fly around and find some food. Um, great. Thank you for doing our icebreaker and getting our head uh, in the game here. Again, that is an activity. Dallas, they also have different names. Yep, that's true. <laughs> Definitely sounds like a response we get from one of the youth in our groups for sure. Um, uh, that's a great one to end on. I like it. Uh, this is a, a really great uh, highlight of one of the activities that we have in Science Action Club for Bird Scouts, uh, and it kind of highlights uh, what we are going to be talking about today. So let's jump into things. Um, oop. There we go. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Rachel Van Squick. I am the Science Action Club manager. Uh, we are a small but mighty team out of the museum here in San Francisco. And uh, I myself have been working at the intersection of science and out of school time for about 10 years. Uh, and it all started actually in Indiana. I went to college there, which is really exciting to be able to talk to all of y'all. I studied biology and I was just so jazzed about everything I was learning that I wanted to share it out with folks. Uh, and kids. So I've been working all across elementary school, middle school, mostly in after school programs at museums, all different kinds of spaces. So really excited to kind of extend that work with Science Action Club. Um, what I'm hoping to do with all y'all today is to share about Science Action Club's model as a potential resource for everyone. Um, learn how citizen science, which is the STEM tool that we use within Science Action Club, how uh, citizen science can be used in 4-H all across the states uh, and all the different places that y'all work in. 
and walk away with ideas on how you can get involved, how you can use these resources. And again, this is super interactive. I wanna be able to chat with y'all today and see you if you wanna be on camera. So I invite all of that this morning. Um, I have some stuff planned for about 35, 45 minutes to walk through some different activities and some uh, sessions that we can do together. And then I'll leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end just to see uh, if anybody's interested or if they just have questions in general. So that is our plan for the day. Um, as a high level, um, Science Action Club uh, is a content provider. Uh, I'm gonna be walking you through activities that highlight our different components, but I wanted to give you the quick facts here uh, so you have a good understanding of who we are and what we do as we go into those different activities. Um, so again, Science Action Club is a content provider. So we give kits, we give curriculum, and we give training to um, out of school time programs all across the country. Um, we are primarily focused on middle school programs, but we do uh, see success in elementary school as well if you work with those folks. Uh, and why middle school, uh, as some of you probably have seen, middle school is a time where a lot of students lose interest in STEM, a lot of uh, young women lose interest in STEM. So we're really trying to keep that interest and that excitement um, and that confidence in science in middle school. And that's why we focus on that area. Um, we have three unit topics, birds, as you saw with our icebreaker, bugs and clouds. So again, birds, bugs, and clouds. Um, if I'm allowed to have a favorite, my favorite one is bugs. Um, don't tell my boss that. <laughs> uh, and we also have it in two languages, English and Spanish. So if that's a, a concern in the county you're working with, um, we have that. Uh, and again, each of those three unit topics is anchored with a citizen science project. And we'll dive into what citizen science is a little bit later if y'all haven't worked in that. Uh, and each of those units has 12 60 to 90 minute sessions. Uh, so we've seen programs do that in a week. We've seen programs do that across a semester. And it really is flexible for those different models. Um, what we also offer is that all of the educators that do our program have access to training so that they are ready to jump into this program and they are confident and they're excited to run it on their own. And I'll highlight that in a little bit. Um, and again, SAC is all across the country. We can run our program anytime, anywhere. Uh, the kind of running joke on our team that we always share is we've had programs in New York City in the summertime, if you can imagine that kind of uh, challenge. And we've also had programs run in the wintertime in rural Alaska. So on those two extremes, um, they have run, they found bugs and birds as well as seen clouds. So it's definitely flexible for many different environments. And that flexibility extends to the fact that some of us are teaching online. So we have resources to show you which of the activities in those units is applicable to online, which is in person. Um, so if you do have that concern throughout the semester, we can figure that out. Um, okay, before we move on, I do also just wanna acknowledge that we are transitioning off of a challenging past school year, transitioning off a challenging summer. There's existing challenges for a lot of our youth here. Um, so Science Action Club as a program, we really want to get uh, youth excited. We want it to be fun for the educators that are teaching it, and we want it to be easy on administration as well. We want the logistics to be really low. So that's kind of the sweet spot that we're trying to go with. Okay. Uh, and just so you know that we walk our walk, and I'm not just talking the talk this morning, these are the eval results from our last year's uh, evaluation, so surveys that we send out to educators and youth, showing that both educators feel more prepared and excited to teach about science, and that youth are feeling more confident uh, and want to learn more about science after being in Science Action Club. And I'm happy to share more of this data if anybody is interested in that. Um, okay, uh, I understand that on our call today, we have extension educators from all across the country, uh, I'll call it the state, I should say, not the country, um, from very different 4-H uh, programs. So uh, I understand that's from natural resources departments to health and human sciences. And that means that 
a variety of people might be teaching Science Action Club if you run this program in your county. So it could be you yourself, it could be a volunteer, it could be someone else. Um, and that's why I think the online training is a really good fit for 4-H because it's something that'll get anybody prepared. So it is designed to be not only fun and interactive, there's games, there's storytelling, there's surveys. So you kind of have a, a, a dynamic experience in it, but it's also created so that if you're new to teaching science or if you've been doing it a long time, uh, you can feel prepared to have Science Action Club uh, in your program and ready to go. Um, so again, flexibility is that word of the day that I'll keep using it. Uh, everybody who enrolls in Science Action Clubs gets access to our online training, which is asynchronous. That means you can start it and stop it as many times as you need to get through all of that material. Uh, your volunteers can as well. Uh, so it really is flexible to uh, your time frame, your schedule, and who you're going to be working with. Here are some screenshots from that online training. Uh, and the different topics that we cover. So it gives you some foundational information for each of the topics. It gives you teaching toolbox information, which we're gonna jump into in a second. It reviews all of the activities that we have in Science Action Club and then extension resources. A lot of stuff, uh, if you need to print up some more papers, if you need the guidebook, if you want additional resources, we have all of that aggregated there. Um, but let's dive into one part of our online training to give you guys a snapshot into this. Uh, one section of all of our trainings is all about the SAC teaching toolbox. These are STEM facilitation strategies that folks can adopt in their own practice that create a safe environment and a fun environment for the youth to learn and also us as the teachers to be able to learn alongside them as well. Um, these strategies, as well as your own expertise as an educator, combine together to really create an awesome experience for those youth. Um, and we know with a lot of STEM learning loss and post-pandemic challenges with the youth, um, that STEM is really important and that educators are really the, um, the number one driver of student engagement. So when you have somebody who's excited and confident to teach, um, that's when the youth are really uh, excited and confident as well. So here are the four strategies in the teaching toolbox. We are going to jump into one of the activities that we have in our online training for these right now. Uh, and I thought we would do connect to prior knowledge this morning. Uh, so we know when you're working with youth, connecting to prior knowledge is powerful. It gives the youth an opportunity to make sense of new information, make connections, uh, and also make them feel valuable in the discussion that you're having in that activity. Uh, and it also helps us as educators to know where are they at, where are they coming from, what do they know about, uh, so that we can set a really good tone for all of the activities. So um, one of the ways that we can do that is, let's say you're teaching our clouds unit and you're about to go outside and identify clouds and you wanna assess some of that student knowledge. Um, you can do this next activity. Uh, so I welcome you to, again, pull out that chat box and engage with us. You can answer these next questions as uh, an educator, as yourself, or if you would like to magically transform yourself into a middle schooler again, I welcome that. And you can answer from the point of view of who you would be teaching as well from that middle school age. Um, okay, so if we see this image, or if you see the sky, you look out your window right now and you see this, what is this sky telling you? Or what does this image remind you of? What comes to mind when you see this? Go ahead and chat it in. Rain is coming, rain, rain, yes. Storm even, uh-huh, yes. Thunder, exactly. So this one, this one is definitely one where uh, it evokes a very strong reaction in us. It's a very clear way of uh, knowing what the sky is trying to tell us and what those kind of clouds are. Um, and this is a really good way of learning, um, like what do the youth see already? So somebody in the program might say, oh yeah, when I saw the sky, I had to get my rain gear before I went to soccer practice and then I got rained on and then soccer was really muddy. And they may meander in their response, but you're tapping in on something about what this particular cloud meant for the rest of their day, meant they got rained on. 
Uh, let's try one more. Um, what does this image remind you of? What do you know about the sky when you see something like this? What do you see in this image? Fluffy clouds. Comfortable day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ooh. It looks like Sam is doing some cloud gazing and saw a dog. <clears throat> Definitely. Someone else sees the dog head as well. Yeah. Sunburn. Yeah. Grab your sunscreen. <laughs> Definitely. Get some sunscreen for the kids you're working with as well. Uh, time to do a sunscreen check. Yeah. Uh, and what was that old um, painter's name that would do happy little clouds on his images? That's what this one always reminds me of as well. Um, so again, this one is one that, uh, Bob Ross, thank you. Yes, of course, how can I forget that? Classic uh, <laughs> person from our childhood, Bob Ross and his happy little clouds. Uh, so this image uh, evokes something kind of different emotionally, but uh, students can have a lot to tell you about that. When you see happy little clouds, we know it's a certain type of cloud and you can connect those stories they're telling you about that with the name of the cloud. Uh, you can say, remember that dog we saw in the cloud? This is connected to the name of it. Let's learn about that cloud type. So connecting to prior knowledge is a really powerful facilitation tool uh, for all of us as educators. It tells us a lot about those youth. Uh, it really helps to honor the youth's experience and help them uh, say like, we see a lot of the things that you've had uh, in your own experiences from your various backgrounds that you're now bringing to Science Action Club, you're bringing to this class right now. Um, so that is a really quick teaser of one of the strategies in the teaching toolbox that we teach in Science Action Club. So again, that's one component of that online training that gets folks excited and prepared to lead Science Action Club. Um, but not only are these good in Science Action Club, these are strategies that you can use across all of your enrichments. So you can use this in your sports club, you can use it in cooking, you know, whatever else is happening with the youth or um, with other folks that you're working with. So these are ones that are uh, great to learn within the context of Science Action Club and that are great to learn beyond that as well. Uh, so I wanted to give you all a little teaser about what the online training looks like a little bit uh, and how we can push our own facilitation practice um, when we're teaching. But let's dive into the other components of Science Action Club um, and the, the mechanism that we use for engaging in STEM and learning about the natural world, learning about our backyard. Um, we use a tool called citizen science. Um, some groups are now calling it community science as well. So uh, you might've heard either of those terms. I am curious uh, if you could pull out that chat box again, if anybody has done citizen science or participated in a bio blitz or uh, you know, touched on that at all, I'd love to know, I'd love to connect to your prior knowledge and uh, learn a little bit about if anybody has participated. And it's totally okay if you haven't. Um, we wanna kind of see where folks are at. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna guess that maybe folks haven't. Great. Um, I have some slides that kind of explore what it looks like and then we're gonna practice uh, one of the activities and one of the kits to learn a little bit more about what citizen science is. Uh, but why did we choose citizen science as our STEM tool? Uh, with youth, it ignites curiosity. It gets them contributing to authentic science. So they're not just practicing or pretending to be scientists. They are actually doing the science. They are walking through those steps. And that in turn really builds up their own confidence and really builds up their own uh, STEM identity. So they can say, I'm a scientist, I'm able to do all of this. Um, the kind of definition of citizen science is uh, it's a global movement where scientists and non-scientists alike make observations, collect data and help answer questions. Uh, so in Bug Safari, for example, <laughs> We are asking um, the youth to go out to find bugs in their own backyard, in the schoolyard, wherever you are practicing. They take pictures of that and then they put it on a citizen science app. 
uh, that then aggregates all of that information into one big data set that folks can be using to ask questions about pollinators, to ask questions about season change. Uh, so it really shows the youth that the information, the data that they're collecting is going to scientists that use this. Um, and through that, um, you're able to tell scientists that they are making valuable, you're able to tell those youth, sorry, that they are making valuable contributions to the science field. Uh, so it really is a powerful tool. Um, and that's what we're using in Science Action Club. So we teach all of those steps in all the lessons so that they know how to collect all that information and put it into that app. Uh, but what's cool about citizen science, it's a global movement and folks aren't just using it in Science Action Club, they're using it um, all across the world. There are several events where folks come together to do a bunch of uh, observations at the same time, both digitally and in person. And I wanted to share one of my favorite citizen science observations I've seen uh, that came from a big event where different uh, cities and communities do nature observations all across a weekend as a competition with each other to see who can collect the most pictures. And one of, uh, one of the pictures that was caught was this one. This is uh, in Florida that it was <laughs> caught. And uh, this particular citizen science just had their phone out. They were taking pictures and they got this amazing series of images of this bird that swooped down, picked up that iguana. Uh, this next picture, as you can see, the bird dropped that iguana. Um, <laughs> and then finally, uh, the picture that they got is the iguana hit the ground, was totally okay, and ran off uh, to live another day from that bird. Uh, and had this person not been participating in citizen science, uh, they wouldn't have gotten this uh, remarkable and a little bit silly set of images, and we wouldn't have learned uh, about that bird's particular behavior. So it's a really cool highlight of the power of all of it and kind of why we ask uh, youth to participate in all of it. So let's transition into doing one of our protocols in one of our units. So again, here are three units, clouds, birds, and bugs. We are going to jump into CloudQuest to do our next uh, activity. So in CloudQuest, this is when uh, youth and educators are learning about weather and climate. They're collecting information about the sky and observations about the sky that they then submit to the Globe Observer Citizen Science Platform. And GLOBE aggregates all that data and actually sends it up to NASA. And NASA is able to use it to validate and calibrate their satellite images. So basically, when you're collecting information on CloudQuest, you're saying, this is what's happening on the ground. And NASA is saying, this is what's happening in the sky. And uh, they're matching that up, which is really cool to tell youth we're collecting data for NASA. Um, to walk through what the citizen science protocol looks like in each um, session, Again, in each unit, there's 12 activity sessions that are 60 to 90 minutes. And each of those starts with a citizen science observation. Uh, so first thing is you get those groups uh, that you're working with into teams because collaboration is important in science. Uh, you pull out all the materials from the kit that they need. Um, and then you ask the as teams to go out, collect their observations, um, get some information about the sky and then uh, we ask that they come all together, all the teams, and they submit one observation together. So they really have to agree and reach consensus as a team to be able to submit that information, which is a really important process in science and for youth to kind of work together and learn how to be good team members. And then the very final session of Science Action Club, they're actually reviewing all of that data that they've submitted. So they can say, hey, we've done this 10 times already. Let's look at all this data that we have and let's you know, observe what we found over time. Now, uh, this is what our CloudQuest kit looks like. So if you're interested in enrolling today, this is the materials that would be shipped in the kit um, out to y'all. And we are gonna dive into two of the materials that we provide in there um, that help you with that citizen science protocol. Uh, here's some fun pictures of folks using it in action, uh, here's their Science Action Club notebooks where they take all their notes. Uh, and here's some observations they're making of a very pretty blue sky right there. 
Um, I'll be sharing some uh, links afterwards and I can share a sample lesson that connects to these topics so you can kind of see how it's written and how those steps are broken down. But today I wanted to briefly practice two of the tools that we have in Science Action Club that are connected to that citizen science protocol. So let me introduce them. On the left, we have our cloud cover grid. This is a grid that you get that is on clear cellophane, so you'll be able to see through it. Um, and it is used to estimate cloud cover in the sky. So each of those teams is looking at different parts of the sky and kind of etching that data together to get a snapshot of the full sky. Um, so it's just an eight and a half by 11 grid and then you hold up to the sky like that. Uh, so we'll be practicing that grid in a second. And the strip on the right with all the different colors kind of looks like a paint strip. That is called our sky uh, color strip. That is one that you hold up to the sky to determine what the closest sky color is, which is another important observation for what's going on with those sky conditions that day. So let us uh, magically transform ourselves onto this, uh, we'll call it our Science Action Club Island for the day. If I had a big enough budget, I would uh, send us all on vacation to this island to do some cloud observations. But today we'll have to have this picture um, be <laughs> good enough. Uh, so we're all observing this same section of the sky. We are now going to estimate the cloud cover on the sky. So pull out your chat box again. I'd love to get some um, uh, observations here. So imagine you have that eight and a half by 11 square sheet that you held up to the sky here, and we want to estimate the percentage of the sky that is covered. Uh, it's a little hard to do it this way, so take all those clouds and imagine how you would smush them into a few of those boxes um, on the grid, and then you can chat in what percentage of the sky you think is covered. Is it 5% of the sky, 20%, 50%, 75, 100? Um, okay, okay, great. We're getting some similar responses here between 20 and 25 from folks. I'll let a few more people kind of walk through that exercise a little bit. Okay. Oh, wow. 18%. Great. We're getting some good consensus. I've done this <laughs> activity with folks and I get a variability from 5 to 40%. We have some very uh, precise 4-H educators here. I love it. Um, great. So uh, if all of y'all were a team in Science Action Club, I would ask for you to come together and agree on one percentage uh, of the cloud cover. And then because this image, that uh, eight and a half by 11 cloud cover grid that you're holding up to the sky is just covering that one section of the sky, you would then repeat it for a north, south, east, and west. And then you would also repeat it for low, medium, and high sky. Because uh, we want to estimate the different parts of the sky Sometimes the high sky is covered in clouds, but the low sky isn't, or vice versa. Uh, so it's important to etch all of that uh, uh, data together into one observation. Okay, so thank you for practicing that step in our citizen science protocol and collecting that data. We are now going to practice uh, the sky color strip. So this is a strip uh, that you hold up just comfortably uh, slightly above your shoulder when you're observing. And you want to guess the darkest portion of the sky. Uh, so where is the darkest color and how does that match up with the sky color strip? Uh, the, the sky color is a little hard to read. So I'll say it out loud from the top, the deepest color to the bottom. Uh, the top color is deep blue and then blue. Middle color is light blue, pale blue, and then milky. Uh, so go ahead and chat in which part of the darkest portion of the sky matches up with what color on that strip. Okay, and we're also getting some great consensus. You guys are just a natural team already. I think we have deep blue as our final answer. Great, thank you everybody for chatting that in. Uh, so again, we have our cloud coverage. I think we agreed right around 20 to 25% there. Sky color is deep blue. These are two of the data points of a handful of data points that you ask youth to collect every single time that you're gathering together as a science action club and you're submitting that to the app. Um, that teacher has an account on the app. So at the end of all the sessions that you have, you can go back and review all of those and say, look at all this information you collected, all this information we provided to NASA, 
Um, and uh, they can observe and learn about that data and kind of reinforce that really important process. Um, so thank you everybody for stepping through that uh, and observing this sky. Um, I think we all basically are citizen scientists and we all work for NASA now because we gave them information. So congratulations. Um, excellent. Um, so I, um, I want to reinforce some of the, um, the model that we have that we covered in the few short activities that we had this morning. Um, again, Science Action Club is that content provider. So we give you that online training with the teaching toolbox. We give you that kit of materials and we give you the curriculum so that you can implement this uh, with the youth that you have on site. Uh, we walked through two activities to so spot the difference at the very beginning. And we just did what we call sky survey, which is that citizen science protocol in CloudQuest. Um, this is our CloudQuest kit. So these are kits that are designed for groups of 20 youth. Um, there is a lot of teamwork and some shared tools um, so that you're able to get youth into different groups and have them practice that, which is really important right now. Um, but I also understand that all of y'all are representing different counties that might have very different safety regulations. So some of you might be thinking about virtual learning during the semester as well. Um, what we've done with Science Action Club is um, the 12, 60 to 90 minute lessons that are in each of those units are all great in person. Um, but we have a resource where you can basically search for each of the units to see which of the activities are best for virtual learning as well. So let's say you start CloudQuest with a group and the safety regulations change in your county and you need to now teach virtually for a few sessions. You can use that uh, searchable index to say, can I do the next activity virtually? It'll say yes. Uh, and you just transition to online for that. So we have that flexibility. Again, flexibility is that word of the day um, to be able to implement in those different environments. So um, let me know if there's any questions about that or if you have a specific scenario that you want kind of brainstorming help with to see if this could fit into that. Uh, but we understand there's a lot of dynamic change right now, so we want to make it nice and easy to be able to use Science Action Club. Uh, and I also want to talk through some enrollment steps. So Science Action Club is a program that we are selling. Uh, what we heard from a lot of programs is that uh, cost is a barrier. Budgets are tight. This is very uh, top of mind. So about a year and a half ago, we transitioned to what we call a sliding scale. And we base it off of the annual operating budget. You can see it's all the way from $150 to $1,500. $1,500 is the full cost of that kit uh, for the kit curriculum and the training. Um, but at the end of the day, Science Action Club very firmly believes that cost should never be a barrier for a program that wants to do our program, that's interested in our program. Um, so we offer this as a starting point. This is not set in stone. Um, but we found that programs that have budget want to spend it on curriculum and tools and that when they do spend even 100 bucks on a kid, that they are uh, much more accountable and excited to teach that program and really try to integrate it sustainably. So I wanted to offer this uh, as one of the steps in the enrollment process, but to kind of bring this to life a little bit more, I wanted to offer some examples of how um, folks have used the sliding scale and what it looks like in different program models. Uh, since all of y'all are coming from different counties, I thought this might be helpful to kind of show some examples. So the first one is um, there's a private garden. I changed the name just to Rachel Garden uh, that had a private donor that wanted to purchase the full kit at a cost. So that person bought the kit for them and they now use uh, that bug safari kit with their middle school programs. A lot of the resources are reusable, so they really just needed that one time purchase uh, for all of that. So that is one example of how programs used uh, the sliding scale and got their kits. Another one, uh, there was a STEM coordinator who was able to purchase a set of kits and use them as a lending library for the programs that he trained across his region. So he was more of a hub person that wanted to bring Science Action Club to a lot of different sites. So he got a handful of kits on the sliding scale. He did not use the full price. And he uh, kept all of those kits nice and clean, would print up some extra materials, 
and collect them and redistribute them. So he was able to use them a lot and is still using them. This is an example out of uh, North Carolina. Uh, another example, a program just wanted to implement it across a bunch of their sites. Um, this is a YMCA that we work with and they have 44 sites that they ran in the summertime. They got kits across all of those sites and they were able to get a bulk discount on that sliding scale as well. And we made it work for their budget. And last but not least, there was just one program that needed one kit and all they could contribute was on the low end of the sliding scale is $150. Uh, so these are only the true examples of what we're working with, and I really want to emphasize that all these scenarios are okay. I want to emphasize that cost should not be a barrier. Um, if you are excited and interested in this program and budget is a concern, reach out to us. We want to have a conversation. We want to make it work. Um, our main goal is getting these resources out there, um, and our secondary goal is to sustain our program through revenue generation, so I wanted to highlight all of that. Uh, so again, here's that sliding scale just with that new lens of the different scenarios and the flexibility that we have. Um, again, we're not trying to add stress to your site. We're trying to add STEM programming. We're trying to add some fun, trying to add some time in nature. Uh, so let us know. Uh, one last point on kind of funding. If you have a grant in mind, if you have a private donor in mind for all of that. We also have a fundraising hub that has copy and paste information that you can use in grants uh, or customizable information, emails that you can use. So I'll send that out in the follow-up information. So if you uh, wanna jump on that, that's a resource that you can start with. And again, our team is available as well. Okay. Um, and last but not least, how you actually enroll in Science Action Club. Uh, First, if you're interested, uh, but you have some questions, reach out to us. I'll send my contact information out. We can have a conversation. Uh, secondly, if you're ready to jump on it, we send you an enrollment form. It takes about 10 minutes. You tell us where you're running the program, where to ship the kits, who we should email, what type of kits you want, all of those details. Uh, and from there, we ship the kits out to you. Um, our accounting team can coordinate with yours so we can make it nice and smooth to uh, transfer those funds. And uh, from there, we want you to stay in touch and we want you to tell us every time you're using our kits. We love to kind of demonstrate our impact over time, uh, as well as find new partners that you're working with as well. So it is as simple as that. And oh, here we go. We're at our final slide. <laughs> uh, here's our program page. It's calacademy.org slash SAC, which is our Science Action Club acronym. Or you can email us directly at scienceactionclub at calacademy.org. Uh, so go ahead, uh, visit there. But I'll follow up with Danielle and send, some, uh, send those links, send that email. Uh, I can send the fundraising hub as well as some of those sample lessons so you can kind of see what it uh, looks like as it's written as well. Um, and we are ending right when I thought we would, which is fantastic. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and yeah, we have about 20 minutes left. I welcome any questions that y'all have. So go ahead and chat them in, or you are welcome to hop off uh, the mute and just ask them straight away. Okay. Great. Well, if there's no questions, I am going to pop back over to the slides because I have a homework assignment full of you. <laughs> uh, since we introduced Science Action Club and Citizen Science, I wanted to show a very quick video. It's just about three minutes on how to download the iNaturalist app, which is the Citizen Science project that we use. Oh, saw Dallas's reaction. <laughs> If you've heard of iNaturalist, then you have heard of citizen science and you've participated in citizen science. Um, this is an amazing, amazing app that um, you can take a picture of something and it will actually prompt you and kind of tell you what it thinks you are looking at. So it's a really great way to identify insects, identify a lot of stuff. So I'll show this video that teaches you how to download that app and start practicing these observations. Uh, and I encourage you all to do that with yourselves, with your family, with your kids, 
Um, as well as if you are doing Science Action Club, this is what uh, you'll be using in the bugs unit as well. So let me go ahead and share again, share sound, and this will be your homework. Okay, so you've installed the iNaturalist app and created an account. Time to get outside and record your first observation. Here's how to do it. Any living thing, like a plant, animal, or fungus, can be an observation on iNaturalist. Once you find something you'd like to record, just tap Observe and take a photo. You can review your picture, then hit Next if it looks good. To identify it, hit What did you see? If you have an internet connection, iNaturalist will suggest 10 visually similar species and often a common ancestor. You can choose one of those or search for a species name. On this observation details screen, you can add more photos of the same organism or write a note. The date, time, and location have been automatically added. You can also change the geoprivacy of the observation, mark whether it's captive or cultivated, or add it to a project. Once you're finished, just hit share and your observation will be uploaded for everyone to see and identify. That's it. Keep on exploring and sharing. Excellent. Uh, if there's one thing you take away from uh, my talk today, uh, well, if there's two things, it's Science Action Club is awesome. I would love to partner with all of y'all. But um, secondly, science, uh, citizen science is really easy to get started with for yourself, for your youth, your family. Uh, they really try to make that barrier low so that you can start getting out there and submitting data and practicing. Uh, what I love about iNaturalist is there's a lot of, I don't know plants super well, so I'll often use it on plants. And the community on iNaturalist as an app is so strong that I'll often get folks that are uh, telling me what species I saw and confirming that. And you can even have little conversations in the chats as well. So it's a really great way to like sharpen your own practice as a naturalist and, and learn about what you're seeing out there. Um, I saw some comments in the chat box. Oh yeah, Liz has used iNaturalist as well. Fantastic. Uh, Dallas is saying I did a couple of photography workshops. Yeah, and they use that with iNaturalist as well, which is great. Yeah, a lot of um, photographers get really excited about posting their stuff on iNaturalist. Um, there's definitely an overlap between naturalists and photographers. That's fantastic. Um, Christy, I'll answer your question. Are there different prices for a different number of kits? You said that 150 bought one kit, or is it just more content? A great clarifying question. Yeah, so the sliding scale that I showed is just for one kit cost. Uh, so that 150 is for one uh, bug safari kit that's English or Spanish. So it's the same price across all units and all languages. That being said, if you're working with a handful of sites, um, we can think about bulk discounts on top of that as well. Um, there is a lot of flexibility in our sliding scale. And at the end of the day, um, you know, if you have $500 in your budget to do STEM programming and you need uh, eight kits, we can figure that out and make that work. Um, we don't want to be really firm in our pricing because, again, we're just trying to get a science action club out there. And we understand that cost is very different with different programs um, and that cost can be limited for a lot of programs. So we really want to make it work. Um, and that sliding scale is kind of a rough starting point for folks to do that. I'll be sure to share that sliding scale in the follow-up <clears throat> communications as well. Um, Heather is asking, in your experiences, has this program been better to use at an after school program or could it be implemented in a classroom? Another great clarifying question. It, Science Action Club was specifically designed for after school, so we've seen a lot of success using it in those spaces. That being said, um, every year we have a handful of classroom teachers that use it as well. We do have the NGSS alignments for those, so if there's a classroom you're thinking of that would like to use this, uh, we can offer that and they can see if it matches up with their plans as well. But it is designed for after school and out of school time um, in different capacities. Thanks, Heather. Okay, last chance for any questions in the chat box. Okay, so 
walk us through the website. Sure thing. Let me pull that up and then I can screen share again. Um, and I can route you to those sample lessons as well. Let me pull up the screen share one more time. Okay, here is our Science Action Club website. Um, yeah, info on what's included in the kits. Thank you, Christy, yeah. So here's our main landing page. The first thing that you'll wanna to navigate to is explore science activities. Um, and then learn more about kits is right here, the first article. Um, once you pop in there, this is all the information you need for the kits. Uh, so here's the, the questions on the enrollment form. Here's where you order the kits, that enrollment form information. And then here are the three units that we have. Uh, so they'll give a brief explanation of each of them, including which citizen science project they're linked up to. So we can see Bug Safari has iNaturalist right here. Um, and under each of those, there are four links. So you'll see two sample activities, uh, what's in the kits, and then the NGSS connections. So let's pop into this sample activity from Bug Safari. I'm gonna think about it for a second. There's an awesome image of a house fly. Uh, and here's how the units are set up. I really encourage everybody to read through those activities because you can really see how easy it is just to open up that guidebook and read the lesson um, and have that be how you facilitate that lesson that day. So you don't have to change the language. You don't have to do any tweaks to that. Um, it really is written to just speak out loud, which makes it a lot easier for folks. If I navigate back to the kits page, I will show you the kit link. So click on that third link. This is what is in the bug safari kit. So here is the list of all the materials that you find in there. It shows you how many of each of those are, which match up to the teamwork that's in the different activities. One thing I will call out for each of the units there uh, in the kits, there's a lot of materials that are reusable. So you can cycle through them over and over again. Uh, for example, in Bug Safari, there's an aerial net or a butterfly net. So that's something that is super sturdy. You can use it again and again. And all of these uh, sheets that you use that are consumable that the students are writing on are linked in the online training. So you're able to just print them up uh, again and you're able to use this kit over and over again. We really wanted it to be nice and easy to use multiple times. Uh, one distinction I will call out is this top sheet is the full kit. And then this bottom sheet is the refill kit. So this first page is what you would get in that full kit when you are uh, ordering it. And then the refill kit is a separate offering that has some of the materials and it's a little bit cheaper. So we can, um, uh, I can clarify that for any folks that need that information as well. Um, so yeah, there's the three units, bugs, birds, and clouds. They all have that sample lesson, uh, materials list, and NGSS connections. Um, one other thing I will call out is on that main Science Action Club page. Again, I'll link that to you. There's a lot of other information here. There's a program video, um, some testimonials from folks, resources that we have for our partners, which includes that fundraising hub uh, with the grant information if you need that as well. So I'll be sure to uh, link all that in and clarify all of that for y'all when we share it. Great question, Christy, thank you for that. Okay, any final questions? Okay, I was told you have to wait seven seconds uh, in a digital response. So I think that was my seven seconds. <laughs> I hope it was enough of a pause. Uh, if there's not any more questions, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for joining. I'll hang out until uh, the end of the hour. So if you want to ask a question one-to-one, uh, -one, please uh, stay on the Zoom. And thank you, Danielle, for the invitation. Thank you, Rachel. We really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you, everyone.